The Tokyo Subway and Training with a Samurai, just two of the activities Kelly Osborne will be getting to grips with when she turns Japanese at 11.40 tonight. Now, though, it's Grindbusters. The UK is one of the grind capitals of Europe. We throw away enough rubbish to fill London's Albert Hall every two hours. That's over three and a half million double-decker busfuls every year. For the army of professionals who clean up after us, it's a never-ending battle. But modern day life leaves much worse to deal with in the war against the nation's crime. Who clears up the legacy of undiscovered deaths, human fouling, squats and graffiti, and who rids us of the vermin who thrive on our throwaway society? The daily lives of the cleanup teams are often filthy, disturbing, dangerous, and gruesome. Welcome to the world of the Grime Busters. Saturday in the capital and Church Street Market just off Edgware Road is in full swing. Yano, Westminster Council's one-man grime buster, is in good spirits too. Hey! Westminster! It's great for him to be reunited with old friends as the Church Street Market was the beat that heralded the start of his career in waste enforcement for the council. This is the area I started when I started working for Westminster and I've worked um, Church Street Market and the surrounding areas for about a year, a year and a half. It's nice to be back today, seeing a lot of old faces, the people I used to work with. Saturday is the busiest day of the week for the Church Street Market, and Yano is out on patrol, enforcing against shopkeepers who throw out their commercial waste in normal domestic black bags. Commercial waste should be presented in prepaid grey council waste bags, bought for 95p per bag from the council. For Yano, his zero tolerance to the illegal dumpers, he believes is vital to the council taxpayers in the borough. If I wasn't doing my job, the city council would be losing approximately a million to a million and a half pounds a year for unpaid waste offences. That's taxpayers' money. So if businesses don't pay for their waste, it's eventually the council taxpayer which will end up footing the bill. We don't want our council taxpayers to pay excessive high amounts of council tax just because people are dumping their rubbish. The problem for Yarno, especially today with the market so busy, is to differentiate between the stallholders' rubbish, the clearance of which is included in their pitch fees, and the shopkeepers who are illegally sneaking their commercial waste out in the hustle and bustle of the market to avoid payment. But Yarno's seen all the scams before. Sometimes they do pull a fast one or they sort of try and sort of um, persuade me that um, it's not their waste or, or whatever it is, but um, I'll, you know, I've been in the job for such a long time and I know what's going on. So Yarno's up for the challenge. Woe betide anyone who dares to try it on. In the Cotswolds, pest controller Dave has arrived at his first call out of the day. One of his regular haunts, the Cotswolds Wildlife Park near Burford. On the menu today is the usual fare. Got some cockroaches and some wasps. If there's one place a cockroach can call five-star luxury, it's a tropical hothouse, complete with water features, plenty of ready food, and a few friends to share their stay with. These particular ones are American cockroaches, different from the German cockroach, normally associated with infesting domestic housing. But as far as Dave's concerned, the nationality of a cockroach is irrelevant. There you see that, that there, that is a freshly molted cockroach, just hasn't gone red yet. An American cockroach will grow to an inch and a half, maybe two inches. These are very small, these are all nymphs. These aren't difficult to kill, it's just, it's just that the, the numbers of them, they'll feed on virtually every, anything and everything. They'll feed on each other, they're, they're cannibalistic, they'll, they'll, they'll feed on anything that it needs to survive. That's why they're so successful. For Dave, the key is to locate where the cockroaches are hiding. Time then to bring out his secret weapon. This is a camera for getting into the corner so you don't have to move too much stuff about and disturb the birds and etc. You can use them in drains apparently, but I, don't, I haven't got that far. So there they are. The most successful insect ever, I think. There's some in there, but they've chucked themselves up the back. In these uh, brackets, I shall use a little insecticidal dust. American cockroaches don't take much to um, don't take much to knock down. 
When using the insecticidal dust, Dave is always vigilant on not letting the dust come into contact unnecessarily with the more precious occupants of the hothouse. These animals in here are rare animals, so you just want to be as, as careful as possible with them. So they're meeting 100 cockroaches with insecticidal dust on them, probably wouldn't do them any harm, but I don't want them to eat any. Touch wood. Ever since I've been doing the place, I've never, uh, I've never killed anything I wasn't supposed to. For Wolverhampton's proudest litter picker, Lou, and his constant partner in grime, Dave, the continual battle against illegally dumped rubbish continues. But the sun's shining, and their first call of the day initially doesn't seem too bad at all. Just the usual smattering of dog poo. Oh, what we got here, Dave? Uh, dog mess, dog mess. Well, it doesn't seem too bad at all. But that's until Lou peeks to see what's hiding over the fence. Oh, blimey, look at this. Oh, they've had a go again, eh, they? Behind the fence is a revolting fly tip, obviously dumped here under the cover of last night. Like Yarno in Westminster, before Lou and Dave can get to grips with it, they need to try and find any evidence in the rubbish to hopefully identify the culprits. Me and my partner here just have a quick nosy round, see if we can find any evidence as to where it's come from. There's old settees, dog baskets, wicker chairs, newspapers, mop buckets. But as we, we'll clear it up and we'll just have a nose, if we find any envelopes, addresses, we'll hand them into the office and they can probably investigate it. But with hefty fines awarded to anyone who's prosecuted for fly tipping, the offenders are getting even more cunning. People tend to these days, they know they can get fined up to £2,000 on fly tipping. So obviously they'll try and remove as much evidence as they can. Uh, so that doesn't leave us much to go on. But what it does leave, however, is the task of clearing the fly tip. And as always, the heavy stuff gets loaded first. When I came to work for uh, Wolverhampton Council as a litter picker, and obviously emptying the bins in the streets and the lampposts, I didn't realise I'd be moving furniture. If I wanted a furniture job like this, I'd have probably gone to DFS. For a lot of us, finding this fly tip on the first job of the day would be seriously annoying, but Lou is made of stronger stuff. It's not annoying, it's I'm out here, lovely sunshine. It's probably annoying if there was ten foot of snow and I've got to struggle through that. But as it happened, we're having one nice day this year, and it's today. <laughs> when we've moved all this stuff, we can call ourselves Grime Busters! In London's West End, the Church Street Market is busy with bargain hunters, and Yarno, Westminster Council's zero tolerance enforcer, seems to have found his first illegally presented commercial waste, dumped in black bags rather than the council's grey bags, so avoiding payment for its removal. Oh dear, oh dear, what have we got here? Sorry mate, no grey bags today. These are yours, yeah, this is yours. Have you got a grey bag for that please? The problem for Yarno with all this rubbish about is to identify which is household waste and which is the cafes. Oh, it's household waste. Here you can see. This is looks like it's household waste. It's got vegetable waste in it, so this is um, a bag of household waste. That's fine. But the second bag is definitely the cafes. That's his. I'm just going to go in and ask him to bring uh, to bring out a grey bag for uh, for his waste. The owner's not so sure, so it's up to Yarno to convince him. Sorry, mate, have you got a grey bag? That one. Both of them need to be grey bags. Have you got a grey bag? It's yours, it's yours. Come and have a look. Come and have a look, mate. Eventually, Yarno coaxes the man out to prove his point. Here, mate, I'll show you. Here. See, this is, this is, that's yours, yeah, and this, this one is yours as well. This is, the, this is not the right bag, mate. You need to have it in a, in a, in a grey bag. I'll bring out a grey bag and we'll get rid of it. At last, the guy puts the rubbish in the grey bag and the matter's closed. But Yarno's had all this before. He used to be quite, uh, quite persistent in offending for, uh, for commercial waste. It gets a bit tedious after a while. Some things never seem to change. In Wolverhampton, Lou and Dave have made good progress clearing the larger items from the fly tip. Now it's time to confront Lou's most hated legacy left by the fly tippers. As you can see here, We've got an aquarium, just broken, battered glass. Just imagine your children playing here, falling on that. And in the news at the moment, you hear of all this stabbing, you'd stab yourself. 
That could be a killer. Why are people so irresponsible and leave something like that when they know children can come round here and play? It does make me angry to think a child could fall on this and just think of the consequences. But Lou's got very personal reasons for his hatred of discarded broken glass. When I was a young lad and uh, I was playing actually in the churchyard you do with your kids and I jumped over this wall and there was a broken bottle the other side and it actually took a chunk out my leg here which took quite a long time to heal because uh, it had gouged it out and that's probably what I always think about when I'm picking broken glass in that I had an accident when I was a kid if I went to school with children you know that don't you yes I did everybody thinks I was always been old so with Dave and Lou's hard work, the fly tip is eventually cleared. All that's left to do now is clear some of the dog poo out on the grass. Rather a large size, I wouldn't like to meet the dog on a dark night. But on getting up close and personal with the dog poo, there's no chance of it turning Lou's stomach. No, no, nothing tears my stomach. The only thing that tears my stomach at times is looking at him, look at him, my old pal. Number one he is there, David, hey, look at that smile. My team leader, one of the best. He's top hole, I tell you. Coming up in part two, Dave has a go at some wasps at a local riding stables. Lou's day gets more grim as he searches for a dead cat. And we're out with Council Enforcement Officer Vince, busting illegal traders and hot dog sellers on a hectic Friday night in London's West End. Cotswolds, pest controller Dave has sorted the cockroaches at the wildlife park and has arrived at a local riding stables where they've reported a problem with wasps. The wasps have taken up residence in and around a food store, making their home in the cracks in the brickwork. Dave has to be careful dealing with wasps as there could be up to 10,000 of them in each nest, all ready and waiting to defend their home. But the weather is in Dave's favour. They're not too active today because it's... Uh beginning of August as you can see and tipping down the rain but uh, we'll soon put them right. There are three nests to deal with. Best to get the two small ones sorted first before Dave has a go at the big one. The only way to treat wasps nests is to use insecticidal dust which affects the wasps nervous system and also is easily spread into the nest by the wasps coming and going. You see there's, a, there's one coming out all covered in dust there you see he's, he's, you know you've hit the spot when you uh, when you get the white ones coming out, he won't be very happy. Now Dave's dusted the small ones, time to prepare to hit the big one. These will get a bit leery. As well as the pain of getting stung, the problem is that when stinging you, the wasp releases a pheromone that tells the inmates that the nest is under attack, and there's the possibility of thousands of others coming out and joining the fun. This is the most active of the three. There'll be quite a bit more action when these are treated. These ones on the outside, they're not going to really get to bother you. It, but it's the ones that come out to defend the nest that'll, that'll have you. Well, you'll know that within a few seconds of, uh, of treating it. So if I start legging it, you'll know to follow. Right, should we do it? After administering the lethal dust, hundreds of wasps congregate by the nest, but Dave's sure that in a couple of hours, all the occupants will have been contaminated by the insecticide. Time to make a swift exit before the possibility of any reprisals. That one's done. That's another, that's their year ended a bit early. In Wolverhampton, Lou and partner Dave are now on their way to their regular litter picking rounds. But there seems to be no chance today of Lou making good progress as he spied a pigeon slightly worse for wear in the middle of the road. Dead bird here, David. We've uh, stopped now, just uh, looks like there's a dead bird on the road. Uh, obviously, uh, we'll clear it up. It'll save any dogs probably running into the road, try to pick it up and have a, another kill or something like that. So it won't take us too many minutes just to clear it up. Clearing up road kills is a major part of Dave and Lou's daily duties. Whether they're pets or just wildlife, it's all in a day's work. I know one thing, this hasn't died a bird flu. Clearing the pigeon may be one thing, but when it comes to domestic pets, it's quite another. 
To delay the boys even further from their litter picking schedule, they've now been called out to retrieve a dead cat that's been reported by a local resident. But the first thing to do is actually locate it. Yeah, we've had a pound call. Apparently there's a, a cat outside 107 or 117. The pound call was very vague, so we've got to keep uh, having a, a nosy. A bit upsetting, really. It was here today and gone tomorrow. I love animals. Uh, I had three cats myself once they've uh, slowly died of old age and what have you. I suppose I'll die of old age one of these days. Further down the path, eventually Lou finds the unlucky cat. Here you are, David. Here's the cat. Oh, he does look a sorry sight, doesn't he? This has been dead for quite a while. I think somebody's just chucked it here. There's, uh, there's no tags on it or anything like that. What I'll do tonight uh, and the rest of the week, I'll scour our local Express and Star on the Lost and Pound. Somebody may have lost it and uh, if I find out and I can probably get in touch with them and uh, i would tell him where it is. It's sad because it looks like it's a young cat. Now we just get it settled down as nice as we can into the bag. Just tie it up, David. The cat will be taken in the carcass bag to the local depot, as is the procedure with all road kills, and it'll remain there tagged for seven days in the fridge in case anyone claims it. Otherwise, it will be incinerated. Perhaps Lou can now eventually get on with some litter picking. <laughs> In London's West End, the Church Street Market off Edgware Road is coming to a close. But Yarno is still out patrolling the streets, enforcing against shopkeepers for illegally dumping their commercial waste. Looks like he's got just enough time for one more bust. Finding evidence in the bag of the perpetrator for once is relatively easy. This is, this is what commercial waste looks like. You know, it's, it's all this bulk packaging from, um, from products, uh, probably from a news agent or uh, an off-license. Uh, so we'll just try and see if we can get some evidence from these. That's the address. So we'll go in and have a word. Hello. Oh, yeah. I'm Yarno from Westminster Council, from Environmental Services. You haven't used the grey bags? You've got two bags outside. You haven't put them in a grey bag. You need to pay for your waste because now no one's paying for it. Yeah, You've dumped no, it. No, You've no, no, fly tipped yeah. it now. And I won't issue um, a fine. I'll just give you a verbal warning. The shopkeeper reckons he's run out of grey bags, so some stickers on the bags normally used for cardboard boxes will have to do. This time Yarno believes that educating the shopkeeper is the key. When you do enforcement, you'll, you'll educate first. I've just educated the gentleman and I've asked him to put the stickers on and I've reminded him that if he gets too many uh, waste offences, we will, we will have his licence reviewed. Now, he's an off-licence, so if that means that if he has sufficient waste offences on the system, uh, it will ta be taken into consideration when, uh, when he renews his licence. All in all, it's been a long and taxing day for Yarno, but at least it's Sunday tomorrow before the whole process starts all over again on Monday morning. <laughs> In Wolverhampton, Lou and Dave have at last started their regular litter picking round. With all the call outs today, you'd expect Lou to be somewhat downbeat, but it'll take a lot more than that to dampen Lou's mood. Hello, girls, having a good day? Lovely, eh? Hey? Going to home sunbathing or what? You lucky girls. Do you live round here? We'll have two cups of tea, all right, no sugar. <laughs> <laughs> Ta da! You're gonna have a bit of banter with the girls, are you, as a walk boy? With a hectic but very productive day under his belt, it's a perfect time for Lou to reflect on just how the public perceive the career of a litter picker. They see us picking litter and they probably think, ooh, look at them doing that job, I'd never do that. But I enjoy it, I've never looked down on it. I think some people do look down on you, yeah? Just because you're a litter picker. But a lot of people also say, what a good job you're doing. A lot of people say, you'll never be out to work. We probably won't be. But this is a good job, and you leave the streets clean, you can walk away, and you're quite proud of what's that. Now, you've looked earlier, loads of litter here. Now it's all in a bag, ready to be gone away. How long did it take? 10 minutes, 15 minutes? The job's a good one. Let's go and pick that door up. Pick that door up, David. It's 
Friday night in London's West End and over a million people are out on the streets enjoying the multitude of bars and restaurants. For ex-professional soldier Vince, now one of Westminster Council's enforcers, this is the perfect time to catch illegal hot dog sellers. All over the West End, the hot doggers ply their illegal trade, selling often over 300 hot dogs from one cart alone in an evening. It's a game of cat and mouse trying to catch the vendors, actually selling their hot dogs. There's people called spotters. The hot dog traders themselves are the ones that actually work on the uh, stalls. However, for every hot dog trader, there's two or three people that are out there looking for us to alert them to our presence so they can make their getaway. Normally, all Vince has to do is take a good intake of breath to know he's close. You can smell hot dogs. Sometimes when they've moved away from an area, you might not be able to see them, but you can definitely still smell them. Vince has to patrol with support from the police as the hot doggers carry small knives to cut up the bread rolls, which could be used against him. The spotters seem to be one up, though, on the first bust of the night, and they can't confiscate the trolley. The reason why we haven't taken the trolleys away is that we haven't seen a sale, so no offence has been committed. So that we've told these lots to pack up and move away for the rest of the night. If we see these guys again and they're trading, then we're going to prosecute and seize their trolleys. But it's not just hot doggers that Vince is after. He'll bust anybody who's street trading illegally, however creative they may be. Time to go home. What is it? Time to go home. Oh. Yeah. You me? Yeah, time to go home, guys. What's happening here? These guys don't have a license to actually do the portraits. We want license because we want license. However, they don't have a license, so we're actually moving them on to go home. Whether the street portrait painters want a licence or not is no concern of Vince's, especially now they caught a hot dog a red-handed. My colleague has seen the sale, uh, so the hot dog's been sold, so we've got grounds now for the offence to have taken place, therefore the guy is now going to have his details taken off him and we'll be reported to city solicitors for the offence of illegal street trading. And when we're dealing with the hot dog traders, you will get people saying, well, what about me, I still want my hot dog. You wouldn't want to be eating one of these anyway. Partially cooked sausages, not kept cold, ready to get thrown back onto the hot plate. The potential there for food poisoning. Also, look at this way, there's no hand washing facilities on the trolley. So if he goes down and uses the toilet, there's a all point that he can come back up and he'll be next thing you know, be flipping your sausage for putting it into the hot dog bun. I wouldn't want that, would you? But on busting the final hot dogger of the evening near Oxford Circus, Vince gets the opportunity to point out yet another reason not to touch the merchandise. Sometimes in here you find what does look like to be a bottle of uh, olive oil. However, it's not. It's what they are uh, urinating and actually still keeping the trolleys along with the food. All in all, it's been a pretty successful night for Vince and the team with three trolleys taken off the streets. In total, Vince confiscates over 500 trolleys a year, proof that all the hard work is slowly paying off.